Even in the absence of Bill, it is with great pleasure and admiration that I respond to the suggestion that I talk a bit about him on the occasion of the William H. Gass Symposium on, Inter on International Writing. By its very nature and following the address by Susan Bernofsky, which was just wonderful, this is also a symposium on literary transfer and translation to which Bill has contributed all across his career, specifically with his readings and translations of what we've heard a lot today, Rainer Maria Rilke's poetry. We know Bill as a colleague, friend, distinguished award-winning writer, and the focus of us today here as the founder and director, along with associate director, Lauren Coco, of the International Writing Center, Writer Center, which they led so successfully from 1990 to 2001. The center's mission, and that has been read before, but I will read it again, was to build on the strength of this, its resident and visiting faculty writers to serve as a focal point for writing excellence in all disciplines and in all cultures, to be a directory for writers and writing programs at Washington University in St. Louis, in the United States, and around the world, and to present the writer to the reader." Unquote. All this Bill and Lauren did with great vitality, imagination, and activist and creative engagement with all aspects of writing locally and globally. The center emerged as a fixture in the intellectual life of Washington University, the region and beyond, hosting writers and translators, conducting readings and conferences, as we've heard, which we uh, yielded four books, which you also had me we've mentioned before, The Writer and Politics, The Writer and Religion, The Dual Muse, two volumes, and person favorite, the volume Literary St. Louis, A Guide, designed by Ken, our own Ken Botnick, and whimsically illustrated by Emily Pyle, one of his students, which remains, as I said, a personal favorite. Staying with the theme of international writing about literature and translation, I will note that Bill Gass, by his own admission, described his grasp, grasp of any language other than his own as quote unquote feeble. The declaration, this declaration notwithstanding, he slipped, again his own words, over a period of time into translating one very special writer, namely Rainer Maria Rilke. Widely recognized as one of the most lyrically intense German language poets, Rilke surfaced in Bill's teaching over a period of 30 to 35 years as Bill explored with his students issues of epistemology, ontology, and aesthetic theory. Finally, deeply dissatisfied with previous translations, Bill set about to what he called his amateur efforts at translating Rilke. Oder Rilke. <laughs> the result of his labors were published in 1999 in the volume Read Reading Rilke, also mentioned several times today, celebrating the poet as one who, quote, pushed into the realm of forms where language glows as ghosts glow, as insubstantial as the worm's light. Unquote. Rilke had appeared several years before in the Temple of Texts, uh, the booklet that Bill and Lauren, as we heard, put together with Olin Library to accompany the 1991 exhibit inaugurating the International Writers' Center. Bill chose the 86 pillars of the Parthenon to stand for the body of texts that influenced Bill. For reasons of space, the pillars were whittled down to, to 50, Lauren explained that today, to which Bill added a 51st, a handwritten entry of, about Freud's interpretation of dreams, accompanied by a self-portrait that he had drawn of himself at some earlier time. Wanting to share Bill's linguistic high wire acts that was that uh, high wire act that was his translation of Rilke, I have in the past asked Bill to speak to the students in my translation seminar. Aside from his account of the translation process, made doubly challenging because Bill's knowledge of German was and is by no means expert, he described in detail his work with Heide Ziegler a long-term friend, distinguished scholar of American contemporary literature, and a member of the center's executive board. Heide offered line-by-line -line commentaries on the poems, a process Bill described in a brief essay entitled Retranslation. As Heide notes or noted, she was careful not to suggest any translation herself. 
a native speaker of German, Heide was particularly helpful in establishing the historical, cultural, and what Bill calls, quote, other shadowy meanings of Rilke's poems, so much so that each translation, each, trans each one of my translation seminars found a student who would go and translate a poem by Rilke and use uh, Bill's book and commentary. So that was always part of the translation seminar. I don't know about this one this semester, but it always was that in the past. Early on in his career, probably about the time that he was already cogitating over Rilke, Bill published Willie Masters' Lonesome Wife, an experimental novella illustrated with photographs and typographical constructs intended to help readers free themselves from the linear convention of narrative. The multimedia format of this early masterpiece is important in the context of this symposium where we are faced with translation and transfer not only between languages but also between different media, namely word and image. The interme this intermediate tension also governs Bill's more recent novels, The Tunnel of 1996 and Middle Sea of 2013. The protagonist of Middle Sea's twin obsessions are an inhumanity museum and the music of Arnold Schoenberg, talking about multimedia. The Tunnel is a novel about a book. Its central character, a man named William Frederick Kohler, is writing about, quote, <laughs> guilt and innocence in Hitler's Germany, unquote. The reader follows Kohler as he constructs a deeply personal book exploring the history of his own life. Excavating intensely disturbing memories of his past, Kohler also begins digging a tunnel out, of, out from the basement where he works, physically moving earth while he moves through his thoughts, penetrating ever deeper into his psyche as he contemplates history, evil, life, and death. Along the way, translating his writerly excellence into the visual creativity of photography, Bill began taking pictures. Not just any old pictures, but images of objects and buildings which he found architecturally, formally, and aesthetically challenging and exquisite. I'm sure this interest was reflecting the work of his architect wife, Mary Henderson Gass, whose handsome book Park, Park View, a St. Louis urban oasis, presents the history of Parkview Place, where Bill and Mary have lived for many years and which joins immediately Washington University. Reproduced in large format, Bill's photographs adorned the walls of the International Writers Center in what is now part of the library complex at West Campus. I was fortunate enough to receive one of these images, like so big, one of these images as a gift from Bill, an image that typifies Bill's art, namely his ability to extract beauty, visual and linguistic from quotidian objects. My piece shows a piece of cardboard into which water had seeped, giving the image the most amazing and engaging ochre and yellow coloration. You can see it in my living room. <laughs> this abiding interest in the interaction of writing and art was to, come, was to become the theme of the splendidly produced two-volume conference proceedings, which we mentioned before, The Dual Muse, a collaboration between the Gallery of Art and the Writers' Center. Somewhere along the way, in, this in his pursuit of multimedia transfer and translation, Bill joined in a cooperative venture with his neighbor, the photographer Michael Eastman, producing texts that accompanied Eastman's images. The 2006, 2006 volume, Vanishing America, is composed of a collection of photographs from many road trips across the United States. Traveling along the country's byways, Michael captured boarded up theaters and stores, woody, wood, weedy doors, overgrown church buildings, and abandoned hangouts, telling of, of an America that was. Bill's accompanying notes speak to a part which he surely knew as a boy, in, in, as a boy when he was born in Fargo and growing up in Warren, Ohio, where he graduated from Warren G. Harding High School. 
Bill's first novel, Omen Setter's Luck from 1966, which deals with a life in just such a small town in Ohio in, 18, in the 1890s, was declared, quote, the most important work of, a fic of fiction by an American in this literary generation, unquote. An assessment enthusiastically reaffirmed by another writer, Cynthia Ozick, who mo more recently described Bill Gass after reading his, tw his 2012 essay collection, Life Sentences, as, quote, our most accomplished living American essayist, hands down, unquote. It is clearly not a coincidence that our first William Gass fellow, the poet, novelist, and translator Matthias Goritz, also recently published an exquisite volume that combines the pho photographic artistry of Vanya Vukovic with one of his own stories. Entitled Shanghai Blues, it makes us think of Bill's On Being Blue, and as Bill says in the introduction to the 1976 edition, quote, language has too many synonyms, words that approximate each other, yet are never quite identical, some of them being visual, unquote. In the spring of 2012, another multimedia collaboration between Bill and Michael joined word and image and turned from the traditional printed page to an ebook, we heard about that, ebook publication by Stephen Schenkenberg called Abstractions Arrive Having Been There All the Time, which brought together Bill's trenchant essay on modern art and photography with Michael Eastman's series of photographs called Abstractions. Stephen Schenkenberg, who produces the blog Reading William Gass, was uh, clearly alert to the multimedia genius of Bill's art before any one of us even realized that. When Stephen asked Bill how he felt about publishing in, elect in electric form, Bill declared, I don't write for the reader. I'm working for the text, the object coming into existence. It makes its demands, unquote. In our United States, in this new century, Bill Gass continues to make us aware of these demands, especially when these demands disquiet communities nationwide. We're reminded of Bill wanting to bring Salman Rushdie to campus in 2001. At this point, he stated firmly that, quote, nothing, nothing, nothing outweighs academic freedom, which is freedom of expression, unquote. And more recently, commenting on the tunnel, he said, quote, I don't think anything is sacred, and therefore I am prepared to extol or make fun of anything, unquote. Bill Gass will never stop following the demands of the text and challenging our ways of employing words, moving across languages, media, and political differences. And his words are always magnificently on target. Thank you. <laughs>